This session is being sponsored by Sask Energy and we have Graham Belitsky, Senior Damage Prevention Coordinator here on their behalf to introduce our speaker. So please show your thanks for them sponsoring this session. I went and popped up uh, Daryl's presentation to make sure everybody knew they were in the same room. So I was prepared at one time. <laughs> Has it come down? Apologize. Let's take a look here. Okay. All right, good. Thank you very much. I do want to thank everybody here for their time. Uh, I realize it's important. And uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit today does tie in to what Daryl's going to talk about a little bit in regards to safety. So that's why we're here today, obviously. And what I'm going to talk about for a couple minutes ahead of time here. Everybody can hear me okay? Not really sure what that's like. Okay, so the approach to, uh, to safety I'm speaking on today is how we protect people, property, and the environment. I have the fun Mind the Gap slogan up there too, uh, showing that external interference, so what we would call third-party damages to natural gas lines, is its largest single threat causing incidents in our company, Sask Energy. Every year people damage pipelines when they cross and dig near them without the awareness necessary to complete those projects safely. The stats are showing you're going to pop up there, Canada six incidents every hour, Saskatchewan we have two incidents an hour. Our damage prevention commitment here at Sask Energy, and that's part of my job and part of my department is the damage prevention program. Our commitment is to design the safer pipelines, monitor that activity and educate the public like I'm doing here today by providing leading and engaging communications, ensuring all site disturbances, risks and the integrity of our assets and the public safety are managed through our damage prevention program. So if anybody's familiar with the damage prevention uh, terminology, it's something that's come about over the last, well, 20 years, uh, as it came about from an incident down in the United States, the Olympic pipeline uh, expo explosion that caused the death of a couple children, and that's when everybody in the FIMSA and FERC and the National Energy Board and everybody started taking notice of what some of these damage prevention activities are and, and kind of mining that data, right? So we know those stats, uh, you know, two a day in Saskatchewan, uh, being selfish and touting this out here, but 42% of those incidents, so 0.9 every day, we're going to say one a day, affects me at Sask Energy. So if you think of it that way, we have 254 working days in a year, and that is basically what our incidents are every year, right? So that responding to those types of incidents, emergencies, um, whether first responders are called out, whether emergency services are called out, fire departments, those type of things, that dollar amount ends up being close to about $10 million a year here in Saskatchewan. And it's a billion dollars across Canada. So beginning in uh, how do you combat that, right? So obviously we all know first call and click before you dig, and I had it up there too. Uh, and those are the strategies. Those are some of the things that are regulated in the Pipelines Act, in, this, in the uh, Sask Energy Act and regulations, part of OH&S. But you have those things out there, but what are some of the other strategies to get out there? Uh, you know, so beginning in January of 2017, so three years here now, the Sask Energy regulations were changed. There were some amendments to the regulations providing clarification, ensuring that enhanced public safety and customer service, and encouraging safe excavation and supporting alignment with, with the industry best practices. So you can take a look at that slide there. And like I said, I, I like to, to throw that under OH&S law there. Uh, anywhere there is uh, activity going on where a pipeline or a natural gas distribution line is on, a first call is, is uh, required. But like I said, a first call is one step in the process, right? These changes that we had made uh, uh, three years ago align with the core operational focus of providing safe and reliable natural gas distribution and our transmission services to Saskatchewan customers. So my job, my commitment is to work with organizations such as this, as well as your individual villages and towns and hamlets, as well as the rural municipalities, on, a, on the application of these amendments to ensure all we all work to continue to work safely around that buried infrastructure. One way to do that is through our 
new Crown Utility Protocol Agreement, one that I was, that's why I'm kind of here today to, to tout that off. And I'm gonna stick around after uh, Daryl's presentation and I'll be in the back and I do have some copies and examples of that. But what we're doing is making some headway with, uh, with the urban municipalities here now and with the City of Saskatoon has signed on and some of the several of the RMs around the province. So talking to you here specifically, is getting yourselves into compliance with those new regulations. So this type of agreement here is, is used with qualifying parties to avoid the necessity of applying for individual consents in the event of re-entry, maintenance to existing facilities or emergency work. So if you keep in mind with the new regulations, it does say that anything within 1.5 meters of a natural gas distribution line requires consent or five meters from an edge of an easement. So a first call is one thing, excellent. You find out where you're, where you're locating uh, facility or locate where your facilities are within your town or your, your city uh, or village or hamlet. And then you're looking at that and you say, okay, well I did a first call, I know where it is. Well, those first calls are only accurate to a, a meter. So they aren't exactly where it is, and then you need to follow the next step of the process, which is safe digging, which starts talking about hydrovacuuming and daylighting, if you hear that term, daylighting the, the uh, pipelines or the gas lines to determine where they are. Then you start working your project backwards from that. Now, in the Sask Energy Regulations now, that work in and around those lines requires consent to do that from us. That wasn't always the case. So it's three years old now, and we had a year of a grace period. So the last couple of years, we've been really focusing on it. So having that consent in place prior to any of that work. What this would do, this, this new um, utility agreement, would help you get those consents in place ahead of time. So having that maintenance work, emergency repair work, or re-entry work, or even grading, does that matter of fact, in the back alleys, when you're over top of some of those natural gas lines, that type of work requires consent. So getting that consent, it's almost like you would call a master crossing agreement, if anybody's familiar with that terminology. It's a transmission terminology, but having that in place ahead of time keeps you in compliance with the Sask Energy Act and the Sask Energy regulations. So middle of the night example would be if you're out there, uh, water main break, in the middle of the night, you do your emergency first call, somebody comes and locates it, but technically under the Sask Energy Act and regulations, you don't have consent to be there, written consent, because the first call does not uh, preclude extent and getting an agreement with us, right? It's a first call, one service, you have to have that other side of it. So getting into an agreement with us to make sure you have those types of things in place, educating the people working for you, doing those projects, and your own administrators and, and your town work departments, having that agreement in place gives you that compliance component, right? So one of the things I guess before I wrap up is, uh, you know, like I said, there's a, a schedule uh, A and some terms and conditions, but we need to get work on getting yourselves into compliance, having that type of thing. And then along with that, learning where that infrastructure is in town so I can provide you with documentation as to where those natural gas facilities are within your town. So pre-planning your projects and getting those permissions ahead of time when there's new projects. So this, this type of agreement is only for re-entry or maintenance to existing facility work. I do have my card up there. I am going to sit in the back. Normally, I said I don't have time for questions today. Daryl's got his presentations, but I'd be happy to sit and listen to Daryl's uh, Daryl's program, and then afterwards, I can touch base with you on the back there too, and hand out my information as well as take note of where you're where you are, and I can send out whatever is required to your administrators in the town. So I appreciate the time today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Daryl, for letting me interrupt. Okay, good. Thank you. I hope you have a great conference, uh, the rest of it here. I know there's, it's pretty much done, so uh, have a great conclusion to your week, and uh, stay safe out there. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Daryl. Daryl, turn off, everybody. What, no applause? There we go. <laughs> uh, can you guys hear me? I'm using the lapel mic because I hate being stuck behind the, uh, the lectern. I like to wander around a bit, and uh, if the questions get too hard, it makes it very much easier for me to escape. Um, my name is Daryl Chernoff. Uh, I actually I grew up in Saskatchewan. I grew up in the small town of Camp Sack. I'm on a farm just outside. I uh, grew up in the 80s, graduated in 87, and thought I would spend my career lifeguarding, which is what I was doing. Went off to Alberta, did that for uh, another 10 years, and uh, 
I'm not going to give you the entire history. But uh, while I was out there, I got into the law enforcement bug and I became uh, a special constable for a small town out there uh, doing a very similar job to what I'm going to be speaking to you about today, which is the Community Safety Officer Program. In my town, I was uh, a bylaw enforcement officer, but we had special constable appointments to do Traffic Safety Act, Liquor Act, deal with some things like that. So we were out there, we're on the road, we're running radar and things like that. When a bylaw call came on, we went and dealt with that, whether it was noisy party or barking dog or uh, things like that in parks. After that, uh, I really got the law enforcement bug and I joined the RCMP and uh, started out in the Arctic, uh, got posted up in the Arctic. My wife, uh, Tina, she, um, she made me promise when we got married we would, um, we would have oceanfront property and I, 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 felt, I followed through on that and we were up on the Arctic Ocean, a place called Polituck, had a house right on the beach, frozen 10 months of the year. Did a couple of more spots and then I returned home to Saskatchewan and I, my posting in Saskatchewan was in Langenberg, lovely little town and very much enjoyed my time there and where is Don? He's hiding, there you are, nice to see you. Um, did two and a half years there, went on to the RCP National Training Academy here in Depot Division. I taught uh, cadets for seven and a half years, uh, moved into lesson plans and stuff and I finished my career in July of 2019 in violent crime analysis with the major crimes unit. After that, the opportunity came up to work with the government of Saskatchewan in the community safety officer program and given my history way before I started policing to now, I thought it was a good fit and apparently they agreed. So what I'm here to talk to you about is the community safety officer program and how it can uh, be part of your community if that's something you choose to do. Um, some of the slides may not apply too much because I get into shared services between a town or an RM. Um, so I'll probably blast through those later in the presentation just so we can get to a point where you guys can ask me any questions. Can you hear me at the back? It's clear. I'm not talking too fast. I tend to blabber on a lot, so I'll try not to do that. Let's see if this button thing works. Community Safety Officer Program um, developed about five years ago. And it's uh, basically an alternative service delivery for you guys. Um, I have to go by, is this working? Yeah. How about if I jump down? Would that work? Developed by the Ministry of Policing, Corrections of Policing, to provide First Nations and municipalities to deliver um, a supplemental uniform presence. Basically, this gives you the opportunity to have your bylaw enforcement officer, if you have one or are looking into one, to be able to do a little bit more. Some towns are small, uh, or you don't have a lot of bylaw enforcement uh, to do, but you still want to have that uniform presence there. Perhaps you want somebody patrolling in the evening, uh, keeping an eye on the schools, watching the traffic, uh, keeping an eye on people that are, aren't, are failing to slow down as they come through your town. Your bylaw enforcement officer with additional training can become a CSO, get a special constable appointment, and be able to deal with some of those uh, other policing type duties that don't need a fully armed police officer to do them. And I'll get into more of the details later. Um, some of those activities that do not require a fully armed police officer could be community safety, uh, community traffic safety. So whether it's uh, running radar within the town, doing radar or laser in a school zone, maybe it's local standards, you've got uh, an issue with people not keeping up the properties, things like that, more of a bylaw. Well, you can have a bylaw guy show up in a pair of jeans and a, and a, and a hoodie and, you know, try to talk people into, you know, fixing up the yards and so on and so forth. Put somebody in uniform, you usually get a bit more respect out of it and uh, there's a bit of the, oh, geez, they actually have a uniform. There's something standing behind that uniform usually and you get a bit more compliance. And it's not about hammering people and giving them tickets but being able to educate them, having the, the knowledge of the law behind them a little bit more, and hopefully that can work. The other thing we can do, um, dealing with littering. Uh, we give the authority under the Environmental Protection Act of Saskatchewan to have the CSOs deal with, investigate, and lay charges for littering. Uh, how many of you guys have people that just dump their garbage side of the road, just outside your town, maybe in the RM, or within your towns, or on empty lots? This is something um, they can pick up on. 
Even as a police officer, I enjoyed this part of my job. I love tearing open people's garbage bags and things like that and construction debris and just kind of tracing it right back to whoever it was that did, did the dumping. Makes, brings a smile to my face. Uh, the use of CSOs for these roles, oh, better not stand in front of that, enables police officers to remain focused on the more complex tasks. I've done both aspects of this job. I've been that bylaw officer that's been out there to assist the police and you know, show up to a traffic accident just to provide some safety for them while they investigated. Uh, I've done the bylaw stuff and I've also been the police officer where I know I've had to spend time because it takes a number of hours to investigate and do all the paperwork for an impaired. Well, while I'm doing that, I can't be out on the road patrolling around the town, keeping that visibility portion of, uh, of the policing going. Um, still, emergencies and crime, you still need your police officers for that, but common community well-being, local concerns, that's something a CSO can take on. What's next? The CSO is your employee. Doesn't work for the government of Saskatchewan. We provide a special constable appointment Excuse me. That gives them the, oppor or the authority to, uh, to um, enforce some of the provincial statutes. It also gives him some of the tools that he'll need to be safe in his job. Uh, not everybody likes that enforcement person, whether it's a bylaw officer or anybody else, coming to their door. And uh, the training provides the CSOs with some defensive weapons, uh, excluding a gun. There's another slide on that later. You have control over the schedule. You have control over what and where you want them doing things. If you want traffic three mornings a week and the other times you want them just patrolling and keep an eye on the schools or dealing with um, <coughs> excuse me, other issues like you know, littering, dumping, uh, liquor being drunk behind the, uh, the local mini mall, things like that, that's up to you. You give them that guidance and then they have the powers and the authorities to go and do that. Again, CSO provides that uniform presence in the community. Um, as I said before, uh, and I, I lived it for a long time, the RCMP have a lot on their plate, uh, dealing with a lot of the, the paperwork, the files and everything else to prosecute a, a crime, a, a more a criminal code crime. Having a CSO out there can provide that uniform out there, the flying the flag as it were. Um, people see red and blue lights on, on a regular basis within the, the town. Those people that are kind of roaming around looking for some place to break into, maybe they're going to second guess that and move on to somewhere else. It's anecdotal, but it can help. Uh, CSOs can liaise with schools, community groups, talk about crime prevention. They can be the ones that go into the school, talk to the uh, kids, read to the kindergarten class, and develop a good back and forth there. Um, we can also give the uh, CSOs an appointment. Um, to, to basically respond to two criminal code matters that the police wouldn't have to, and that's mischief under $5,000, which is property damage or graffiti under $5,000, or theft under $5,000, generally your, um, your shopliftings and things like that. They can't go to anything that's in progress, but if a store owner or somebody came up and said, you know what, we had uh, somebody spray paint the front windows of the IGA, or Sobeys now, sorry, the, uh, it's not an in-progress crime. We don't need to call the police out to that. The CSO can go, they can gather the evidence, they can look at that, take some pictures, maybe get the statement done, and then get that information to the police to continue their investigation. And maybe that's also gonna tie into graffiti happening in three towns in a row. By getting it to the RCMP or the local police, they can put that together with the other investigations and, and get something done. Um, if your business owners and so on, or your homeowners that have the graffiti there are of the opinion that there's no point, it's gonna take three, four hours to get somebody out there, they can't do anything anyways, getting the CSO out there, getting some of that evidence, the pictures, a statement, when did this happen, gets that information into the police and hopefully they can do something with that. Not always, but at least the information's getting to the police service um, for them to investigate. The differences between police and CSO, the police are going to deal with all your 911, all your crimes. Um, in progress crimes, things like that. Your CSO is going to deal with provincial statutes and not in progress. If anything is dangerous, the CSO is not going to go to it. They're not going to be going to domestics. 
They're not allowed to under the legislation and under our policies. They're not allowed to go to uh, deal with impaired drivers even. That's a policing function. If they come across one within their duties, there's rules and steps for them to follow to get the police there to deal with it. Um, and they can, under provincial legislation, they can seize a vehicle if needed or give out uh, suspensions if the police really can't get there in a, in a, in a short amount of time. Um, shared responsibilities, of course, the Traffic Safety Act and, and so on. Can I move on? I'm not going too fast? All right. So what can they do? Traffic Safety Act, doing uh, your radar, your laser, if you uh, choose to purchase that kind of a unit. Um, one of the things uh, I did in, in Langenberg, actually, uh, Highway 16 crossed there and funerals, churches were on one side of the town and uh, the, the cemetery was on the other. And we would get regular uh, requests from the local funeral home. Could we block traffic to let the, the funeral uh, make its way? This is somewhere a CSO can step in and, and allow the RCMP to continue working on the, the, the crimes and so on and so forth, their investigations, and then have that CSO stop that traffic have that family who's grieving safely get across a highway if it's like Highway 16 and, and move on to something else. Um, texting and driving, things like that. Again, that's something that your CSOs can enforce. So remember February 1st, I believe it was, the, uh, all the fines went up. So that was key there. Legal dumping, environmental protection. I kind of glossed over it a little bit earlier, but uh, I, I, it seems people don't want to pay the tipping fees and so on and so forth at the uh, local um, garbage dumps or landfills. So they're dumping it everywhere. They're dumping it on private land. They're dumping it in ditches. They're dumping it uh, behind your municipal shop. This is something where a CSO can get his hands dirty, his or her hands dirty, and, and try to link that garbage to somebody. And uh, in one case, I walked up to somebody and said, it's your construction debris. You got till tomorrow to pick it up. Wow, that's, wow, what? What are we going to do? I said, you pick it up or I'm going to start laying charges. And it was cleaned up, it was on private land, it didn't matter. Construct contractor had to go back, he cleaned it up, I went and inspected it, he saved himself a fine, but the job got done. Um, they can also get an appointment to enforce the uh, weights and measures portion of the, tra of the sorry, Highways and Transportation Act. So if you have large trucks or issues with oil fields or things like that, and they're damaging your infrastructure, the CSOs can get trained to be able to pull those trucks over, weigh them, and provide fines and uh, education on, to, the, to the drivers and to the companies to basically get the per proper permits in place. Um, the training isn't part of their basic training, but it does happen through the Sask Highway Patrol. Whenever they're doing some training, they offer it to our CSOs, and we get CSOs into that training to, uh, to get that training done. Um, uh, Arm of Edenwold are using their guys for, for this a lot. Um, it's not uncommon to write a ticket roadside for $15,000 for uh, an overweight truck going through municipality. It's $500 a ton for every ton you're over. So big heavy truck, it's going to start adding up. The bigger thing, um, some of the RMs, Arm of Swift Current, uh, and so on, they're showing, or they're seeing that their costs for maintaining their roads are going down. And also the permits that they do sell for overweight. Uh, when they started enforcing all of a sudden trucks and truck companies were buying those permits, they were lining up for them to, to get the appropriate uh, authority to haul overweight on their roads. What else can we do? We can deal with your snowmobiles and your ATVs. Um, a lot of times you got youth bombing around with them, things like that. <laughs> It's hard for uh, them to get caught at the, at the time to be able to dealt with. This is something a CSO could look into. Cannabis and alcohol. So smoking up when you're a little bit too young or drinking in public, smoking of any age out in public. If you're having an issue around your, I don't know, ball diamonds, rinks, things like that, or even if you're not having an issue, at least having your CSO walking through, doing walkthroughs, reminding people of the law. You can't have the booze out. You can't be smoking in public. Butt it out as your warning. Next time they can issue the fine for that. <coughs> Excuse me. So for their safety, 
we do provide them with the tools to do their job. Um, the CSO can only carry the following. OC spray, pepper spray, nasty stuff. I've been sprayed so many times. A baton and handcuffs. A CSO cannot carry a firearm. They aren't trained for it, and we don't expect them to deal with um, policing actions like domestics, uh, shootings in schools, malls, office buildings, things like that. If they don't carry those, uh, they have to be trained and certified in their use up to Saskatchewan Police College standards. So basically the same training we do give a police officer in these tools, we're ensuring the CSOs have that, and they have to recertify every three years. Uh, we want the CSOs to work collaboratively with your local police service. So we've asked that they get into a service level agreement or standard operating procedures with your local detachment um, so they know what roles and responsibilities the CSO has and also what they could even ask the CSO to do, like go to that mischief or that graffiti under $5,000. Um, the other thing a CSO can do if they're noticing problems or you guys are noticing problems with um, a house and there's always traffic going in there, they stay for five minutes, they leave, traffic in, traffic out, is this a place where there's um, drugs being sold or, or, or that type of stuff going on? CSO can be part of the information uh, gathering for uh, SCAN, Safe Communities and Neighborhoods investigators. They can get their information up through the detachment or straight to SCAN. Uh, their notes would be well accepted by SCAN and maybe that's when SCAN can come in and sit on a house and maybe uh, look into shutting down that particular uh, drug den for the lack of a better word. We need to keep the CSOs safe. We don't, uh, they aren't armed with, uh, with, a, with a firearm. They don't have the training to deal with policing situations. So we don't want to put them in those situations. So we limit their traffic activities on highways up to 90 kilometers an hour. So if the provincial highway that goes through your town slows down to 50, they can enforce uh, that speed limit law between or within your municipality boundaries when it's below 50. Uh, if you're swift current and you got highway one going through at 110, they won't be able to do enforcement on 110. Or sorry, on highway one at 110 kilometers an hour. Uh, they're not to attend any type of situation where weapons may be uh, present. So the call comes through that there's a fight at the school, weapons may be present, maybe it's a baseball bat or a machete or things like that. They're not going to be going to that. They may block off some traffic further back and let the Mounties go to that. Um, if they do encounter domestics or what else do I have in there? Sexual assaults, any other criminal event in progress, they're required to call the RCMP or your local police service. Uh, same thing with impaired driving. They are not permitted to engage in a pursuit, so if somebody takes off on them, they have to shut off the lights, pull over to the side, make notes of what they did, and then carry on with their day. That doesn't prevent them from keeping an eye out for the vehicle that didn't, <coughs> excuse me, uh, didn't stop for them. It doesn't prevent them from passing on the plate number and the description and who it was, if they know, to the local police to be dealt with later, but we don't want them getting into pursuits. They're not trained for that high speed Chase. Um, there'll be a good witness, basically. Candidates, qualities, if you're looking into hiring somebody or you're looking into somebody to be a bylaw officer for you and maybe down the road you're going to look at the CSO program. Good character, maturity, exemplary background, grade 12 or equivalent. Uh, 18, sound mind, good character. Criminal record, vulnerable sector uh, check is required. So looking in to make sure they haven't the vulnerable sector query is to check if there's uh, any issues related to letting them be around kids or uh, elderly people or people that are at risk like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they have to pass a physical abilities test. It's the sheriff's officer's uh, physical abilities test. They have to do it in under six minutes. It's similar to the police officer's um, physical ability requirement evaluation, which has to be done in four. Um, they have to take the CSO induction course, um, or if they're like say a retired police officer the last couple of years, retired highway patrol officer, we can look at their qualifications, where they're at, and we can look at uh, basically saying they don't have to go to the program. Encouraged to ensure your potential hires can pass 
the sole path prior to hire. Uh, there's nothing worse than hiring somebody, getting them trained, and then finding that they don't have the physical abilities to do the job. Then what do you do? Um, why? It's their safety. Can they physically extricate themselves from an issue or from a problem, whether it's roadside and a vehicle's about to hit them and they need to be able to get out of the way? Uh, there's the course, just for fun, that little wiggly thing, you gotta do a lap six times, you gotta go up and down stairs, then you gotta go to another thing, you gotta jump over about a three foot high fence six times, and after each jump, you gotta go down directly to your front or directly to your back. Um, you have to do a push-pull, which simulates being in an altercation with somebody, it's holding up, I think it's 80 pounds, and going back and forth in a semicircle. And you gotta be able to pick up 100 kg, or is it 80? 80 kg, and carry that 25 yards, meters, and then place it down. Why do we do all those things? For the agility run, CSO's gotta be able to reposition quickly uh, in regards to an aggressive person, perhaps aggressive animal, or a motor vehicle during a stop, push-pull, you gotta be able to open doors, move things around while you may have somebody under your control, and perhaps in handcuffs. The vault station, you gotta be able to move quickly over offices, uh, objects, fences, ditches, things like that to get to safety. And um, the weight carry, you may be required to lift objects like scales to weigh a vehicle, spare tires to remove others from danger, maybe to assist EMS or fire. So we need you to be somewhat in shape. This is just a little uh, idea. They should be physically active for four to six weeks minimum before they attempt the test. The induction course is approved by the Assistant Deputy Minister as the minimum training requirement for the issuance of a special constable appointment. In the course, they go over the law, the charter rights and freedoms, elements of the offense. There's uh, 45 hours of control tactics training, and that's right from the Saskatchewan Police College. They also were look into um, tactical communications or what's also called verbal judo. So how to talk to people, how not to escalate a situation. And um, they also get some traffic stop training as well. It's four weeks in class currently with two weeks of online training. Uh, the online training is through the Canadian Police Knowledge Network and it's a, a number of online training that police, uh, police services use across Canada. They're from the RCMP to Toronto to the OPP to Quebec to Cape Breton. They all use these. Next uh, training is coming up. May 4th to June 12th, it'll be in Prince Albert. Uh, we need a minimum of eight candidates to make that go ahead. Um, if they have some prior learning, we can look at uh, appointing a person as a special constable. If we, they can show and you can show that, hey, this guy just retired from the RCMP, we want him to be our CSO. How do we go about doing that? And that just happened up in North Battleford. Their new supervisor is just retired from the RCMP. We were able to give him an appointment. He didn't have to go through the training. Um, exemptions are case by case. <coughs> the other thing you can do, you can recruit from the Aboriginal Police Prep Program, which is put on by SAS Polytech. It's a 10 month program and it prepares uh, students for going into police services. But they added in the 45 hours of control tactics training. So when somebody graduates from that 10 month program, on their dime, that's somebody you could hire directly into a position once we get through all the paperwork. Uh-oh, this is the part where I run out. Costs, uh, there are some input costs to, to get this done. These are worst case scenarios, if you wanna look at it that way. First year for a CSO, anticipate 200,000 bucks. Everybody's going, okay, time to go to the next session, right? Um, Look at 75 to 120 and in subsequent years, depending on how you choose to amortize your required assets, and I'll get into that right away. Gotta say, right off the bat, there's no funding currently available for a CSO program. Um, salaries could be anywhere from 40, $45,000 up towards $90,000 a year, depending on the qualifications you want, what you want your CSO doing. Uh, dispatching and monitoring services, that's through the Provincial Emergency Communications Center. I believe your fire departments would all use that to go on to the enforcement and dispatch um, aspect of that. It's gonna be about 26,000 a year. But with that, your CSOs can get access to CPIC, 
which is Canadian Police Information Centre. So when they pull over a vehicle, their safety is increased. They can query that plate. That plate is to a registered owner. They can find out about the registered owner. Is this person a police hater? Is this person wanted for a violent crime and things like that? If they find that out, they can pass that on to the police, let them come in and deal with it. They can back away and say, I'm not gonna pull, I'm gonna just let this person go or I'm gonna have the police come in. It increases their safety. Um, they can also then, once they talk to the driver, if it's different from the RO, they can query that driver and see what their background is. So when a police officer pulls you over, this is something that happens all the time. Who's been pulled over here? I know I have. Uh, they're gonna run you. They're gonna check you on these systems to see, are you a danger? Are there any warrants out for your arrest? Anything like that. So it increases safety. Um, your assets, you're gonna need a vehicle. Do you have to go for the $100,000 leather interior truck no but you do need a white vehicle it needs to be four doors uh, truck suv ford's not making cars anymore unless you want to get them a mustang but you can't because it's two doors so it's going to have to be an suv of some sort or a truck uh, could you buy a lease back could you use what you're currently using already for your bylaw officer for instance possibly uh, you can talk to us in the ministry to see if you know what we already have this vehicle we're replacing it next year can we get started with that and we'll we'll have that discussion uh, required modifications you could spend thirty five thousand dollars putting in the whole light system and and computers and everything like that um, you could spend fifteen thousand doing the same thing uh, there's other places that have done it for about two thousand three thousand dollars with basically putting in the red and blue lights or switching out the orange ambers that they used to have with a switch on the dash uh, it's got to meet the standards of the municipal police equipment regulations but as long as it does you don't have to spend a ton of money so again worst case scenarios uh, there's places out there that are doing it for a lot cheaper than this uniform three thousand dollars that's if you bought five pair of pants five long sleeve five short sleeve three hats two hundred dollar boots and so on you can start smaller uh, it has to be a certain uniform i'll have pictures up there right away but again worst case scenario all in one year supplies ten thousand i'm doubting anybody will need to spend this because you chances are you have a lockable uh, filing cabinet for exhibits and things like that you probably have photocopiers and things like that in the town office you have all these things ready to go it's just making sure that you have them so supplies could could cost a whole bunch of money if you're going to outfit an entire office brand new but if you're going to have them work out of your local town office or another area your costs are going to be less initial training at sas police college if that's the route you're going to go is about sixty two hundred dollars per candidate um, that doesn't include the books so it's a couple more hundred dollars in books uh, the SOPAT test is ninety dollars and that's about it Ooh talk about costs go to revenue this is not a money maker for you however the traffic tickets written in your municipality are going to come back to you 75 percent so you write a hundred dollar ticket once it's paid 75 dollars is going to come to you as a municipality you write a 580 dollar distracted ticket distracted driving ticket what's 75 percent of that i don't know 25 is uh, held back by the province for administering within the courts and so on. That being said, you are responsible for prosecuting these. So if somebody pleads not guilty, your CSO or somebody within uh, your, your service is going to have to be the prosecutor in court for that. Uh, we do provide training on that when needed. Uh, it's something I'm looking at putting into the basic training induction course as well so that a CSO comes prepared to step up in court and prosecute a ticket. Problem here is the CSO in Langenberg, and there's only one, let's say, I know there isn't one, but he can't prosecute his own tickets. So he would have to partner with a CSO nearby to say on these court dates, can you do this? Or better yet, you always have the local RCMP detachment there. You can make an agreement with them saying, your CSO will prosecute tickets for the RCMP and when one comes up for the CSO could a Mountie step up and prosecute that ticket in court something to be worked out uh, places like North Battleford they've got four CSOs they can just switch it out so if I wrote the ticket 
Um, sorry, Don, I'm going to use you because you're only, the only guy I know here right now. Um, he would then prosecute the ticket that I wrote. Um, we get you set up with the databases and so on and so forth. It's part of the process so that that revenue does come back to you. Don't think it's going to pay for the entire program, but it's certainly going to less uh, minimize your costs. Um, if you think about how much you're going to spend on salary dollars on a CSO, you don't want to send them out and say, you're costing us $300 a day, go write $400 a day worth of tickets. That's not what you want to do. But it's very easy for a CSO officer to go out. Uh, when I used to do it, I could pull over 20 vehicles a day, I can give out three tickets very easily and that revenue would come back to my municipality. Mind you, that was a town of about 7,000 people at the time. So a smaller town, you're gonna have less people there. Also, you don't wanna hammer your own citizens. So you want a lot of education going out there with that, pulling people over, advising them what they're doing wrong, sending them on their way, but keeping an eye on the, the high flyers, as it were, the ones that are gonna be going out, uh, speeding all the time. Well, maybe they uh, talk themselves into a ticket every once in a while. Uh, bylaws, you need a bylaw court set up to, to enforce them. Make sure your bylaws are up to date and, and have enforcement provisions. Uh, the Arm of Edenwald has set that up. They do a monthly bylaw court and they're a pretty good resource for that. Uh, you'd have to talk to your provincial courts for any questions on setting up an actual bylaw court for your municipality or for your area. How to employ, approval process. You gotta show a leg legitimate need. Um, Show us why you want your bylaw officer or, your, or an officer, a CSO in your community. Do you have an issue with traffic? Do you have an issue with um, people out and about at night? Do you have a graffiti issue? Put that into a business case, you send it to us, we'll approve it, and then you continue on. You have to be a government. I think everybody here fits that one. You can't have a private agency or a private uh, security agency hired and then have us appoint their officers as a CSO, it doesn't work that way. It has to be an actual employee of the municipality. Uh, go through the program, we'll approve it. Includes a business case. Uh, the application helps potential employers go through each step. I have a, uh, if you're looking at this, you get in contact with me, I will send you out a flow chart of steps and uh, another document that kind of goes along with it that gives you uh, contact information on, oh, we need to get our truck set up now. Well, who do we talk to? And I have some options for you there. Um, when you're putting in your request, what, do you, what jobs do you want them to do? If you don't want them to do traffic, we don't have to give them a Traffic, safe, uh, traffic Safety Act appointment, but it's a good one to have. Geographical area and the requested authorities. This is just steps like fine collections branch, so you get the money coming back to you. Uh, somebody in your municipality needs to act as chief of police. They don't get to go around and say they're the chief of police, mind you. It's just for disciplinary purposes because the special constable uh, is appointed under part five of the police act and discipline is under part four. So your administrator or uh, whoever you want within your, in your, in your uh, municipality would be designated chief of police for disciplinary purposes, basically, if you get a complaint of neglected duty or excessive force, that's going to get reported to your chief. The chief reports to us and to the Public Complaints Commission, and then that process takes over, and we just need a name to be able to follow up. Uh, things we need to see, that, that you have a records management system, that you have adequate liability insurance, so contact your insurance provider, say, we're putting a CSO, here's what we're gonna have them do, are we covered? or do you need to charge us more? You can share or contract these agreements. So, um, you wanna get together with two neighboring towns and the RM that surrounds both of you and share a CSO between the three of you. We can certainly look at doing that. The RM of Swift Current, RM of Webb, and RM of Sask Landing have formed a policing committee and that's exactly what they do. They, between the three of them, they've all put in the funding and uh, they have a CSO working down there for their three RMs. You could also uh, go on your own. Uh, Arm of Edenwald has done this. And then they contract out that service to Balgoni, to Pilot Butte, and so on. And that's another good option if you don't want to fully fund something like this. 
look at making those partnerships. In the Alberta model, there's not a town, there's actually one town, less than 2,000 people that has a CSO. Um, I know some, a lot of our towns in Saskatchewan are small, but you need a certain kind of population threshold to make it work. I'm not saying it's 2,000 people, but it's around there. Um, some towns can do it with less, Maybe they have more revenue coming in from more commercial. If you don't, it's, it's going to be up to you in your particular circumstance, but partnering up with the neighboring RM or neighboring First Nation. I have um, some in the mid part of the province where there's a First Nation, a town and an RM actually in talks to see if they can share that resource between the three of them. Uh, this is where I'm going to just click through. If you're going to do it as a partnership or a contract, talk to us. Um, we're just going to make sure that everybody's aware of their liability concerns, that it's a good agreement, um, things like that. Have a plan of how public complaints are going to be dealt with. Supervisory oversight, liability, all that. CSOs, we have over 30 right now. They're in Prince Albert, North Battleford, Flying Dust First Nation is one of our newest ones. Arm of Edenwald, Swift Current Web and Sask Landing are our policing committee ones. Arm of Kindersley, Arm of Lakeland, Meadow Lake, Weyburn, Arm of Miota, City of Yorkton has two, File Hills First Nations Police have a few of them, Arm of Buckland, and they do a lot of contracting out to other RMs, and the Resort Village of Candle Lake has one in a little bit. They actually have a, a second person hired in to do about 10 hours of additional work per week. There's a uniform. Can't look like a police officer, not allowed. So gray shirts. Darker pants, gray stripe. The vehicle is going to not look like an RCMP car or a city police car. Uh, they have to be white, they have to have the stripe package. There is the city of North Battleford truck, very pretty. Arm of Edenwold, Prairie Sky Region, and that's the uh, RMs of Swift Current, Webb, and Sask Landing. That's their vehicle. I'm actually going there tomorrow. Where can you find further information? We have the CSO fact sheet, um, FAQ, and another fact sheet. You can contact me at the ministry, it's my phone number, and I actually instituted this email address in case I get fired. Uh, that email address will be there for the next person to take over my role. <coughs> um, I do have some of the fact sheets sitting right over there. I have about 20 of them, so it has some of the basic information that I've had here. I also have my uh, business cards there as well. It's question time. Uh, if I've gone over something too fast or you're like, what about this? Please step up to the mic. I'm here to ask, answer any questions I can. If I don't have the answer, I'm not going to make it up. I'm actually going to find the answer for you and go from there. Yes. Hi, uh, Nicola Roth from the Town of Rostron and also the Twin Rivers District. So once this CSO appointment has happened, let's say this person needs additional resources. They need um, information. Does the ministry provide um, more training after the CSO program. What type of information are you looking at? Well, like even just uh, guidance on, on something, because I know, um, and I'll just say this, like we, um, we put a person through the CSO program, right. but we never did appoint them, because in the end we thought that person just wasn't right for that appointment. For that role, okay. And, um, and so yes, we did spend, spend some money, and, uh, but it takes a special person but whether they so if we don't have a retired rcmp or a police officer that doesn't have all that knowledge and experience who can they talk to to get help so that's one of the things that did come up with an evaluation we did in 2017. Um, there is no field training program for the cso however that doesn't preclude other cso areas from being able to take on somebody to put to help them out so if we have a, a good program going in say the arm of lakeland and you wanted your person to be, go up there to do some on the road stuff, maybe work there for a week, that's something that we can, we can help out with. We could look at where, what do they need help with? Does the RM up there, or do they have the abilities to help out with that? Do they have the, um, the time in their schedule to do that? Because it'll have to be up to them as well. But then we can provide an appointment to your CSO to work in that area, pull vehicles over, become more confident in their, in their abilities, um, maybe even just sitting down with them to, you know, we, let's say they want to do more on the weights and measures thing. We might 
look at could they work out of or work or uh, ride along with the Edenwald folks because they do a lot of weights and measures. If it's more uh, dealing with cabin owners and things like that, maybe they would go up to the arm of Lakeland. Um, also, that's part of my role as well. They can reach out to me in my office and say, here's my issue, how do I deal with this? Some that's come up was the, is the prosecution portion of things. And uh, we actually had to sit down, we sat down with a uh, provincial prosecutor, created a program where they can come in and we had the lawyers um, there for the day basically to provide information on how to prosecute in court, what kind of demeanor you should have there, questions to ask, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and that worked out fairly well. It's, it's a process for sure. Um, I'm not saying we have it perfect right now. Uh, we're, we're learning all the time and issues like that, if they come up, sit down with me. We, I could come up to Rostern, uh, sit down with you folks up there with your CSO that you had trained and see what, what we can work out as well. Is there a CSO association? There isn't. Um, we did a conference, a government or ministry sponsored conference to get a bunch of CSOs together last year. We didn't do it this year. Uh, there was no time basically. I'm planning on getting one this coming year. And what I'd like to do is have the CSOs take that over yeah. on their own and create their own association where they can share expertise, they can uh, talk to each other a little bit more. Uh, I'm trying to send out a, about a monthly kind of newsletter through that CSO program email just on things to keep in mind. The last one I sent out was reminders on traffic stop safety, okay. uh, stuff like that. So any way I get more information out to the CSOs, it's going to help improve the program. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, uh, Tracy Yowsey, Town of Klonze. I was just wondering if uh, CSOs could assist the fire department as far as traffic on the highway, extra set of lights, or attending a medical scene with a first responder, especially if they're in a remote location and they don't know the people they're attending? Okay, absolutely. I know the Klonze area. I'm uh, the Carlos is uh, our family of mine up there. Um, yes and no. So the CSO, their jurisdiction is within the municipality of the, that they're hired for, so for the town of Kalanze. However, the RCMP, we do give a secondary jurisdiction to the CSO so that if a police need them outside the town to assist with a traffic accident or uh, an extra set of lights, as you say, the, R the police service of jurisdiction can call out that CSO because they'll have jurisdiction for that. Now, you're asking, if, can the fire department, not technically under the regulations and the appointment, but if the fire is going and it's an accident out on the, uh, out in wherever it is, uh, if the police are going, all they have to do is just get on the radio and call in and call that, our, that uh, CSO out and absolutely, they can go to that accident scene, extra set of lights, getting people to stop or veer off to protect the firefighters that are on the ground and the other police officers that are investigating. Yeah. Medical calls, um, I, I want to say yes, but it would, we'd, it would be we'd, we'd be worried about area. emergency response for that. So if, for instance, uh, one of the CSOs is a firefighter, so he has that training, um, he's got some medical training. So I'd have to, for that one, I'd have to look in to see if they could go lights and sirens for a medical call to provide assistance. Yeah, I think it would be more like sometimes our first responders are attending scenes by themselves. Mm -hmm. It would be more for just their protection. They wouldn't be assisting in the medical at yeah. all, but they'd just be, their presence would be known. I think that we could work that in towards the standard uh, operating agreement or service level agreement of the RCMP and say Kalanzi had one and they want their CSO going to those type of calls. Um, work it into a way so that the RCMP say, could you go there to make sure of safety for our for a first responder. I don't see why not, but I want to make sure that liability is covered and, and we're not putting anybody in harm's way. Okay. Thanks. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Winston Bailey, uh, Councillor of the City of Weyburn. Um, first of all, I'd like to hand out a bouquet of roses to our representative from uh, Sask Energy. Uh, one thing he failed to mention, and in my line of work, is line locations when we're selling properties. And it's so efficient, so easy, three minutes and it's done. So kudos to Sask Energy. Um, on, on the policing, on our CSO, Weyburn is a new CSO here. Uh, she started not a very long ago. Not very long, probably yep. just before I got on yep. to the okay. program. And um, I would just like to say that 
we all know that our policing costs in our municipalities continue to rise every year. That's it's inevitable. By bringing a CSO on board, that has allowed our police officers to do a lot more policing than a bylaw officer or a, a CSO. And so it's really working. The initial start for us in the city of Weyburn, it's really working for us. The other part that you can hard, hard, uh, hard time measuring other than the economics of it uh, is her PR work in the community. Mm -hmm. And it allows us to have her in our schools a lot more, uh, be a lot more visible at the hockey game or the hockey rink or, or whatever. And that's a very important part in a community and it's hard to measure and it allows our police officers to do more policing. Thank you. You're welcome. That's a, you're getting some good anecdotal evidence of, of using the CSO to try and lower costs and, and more basically visibility in the community. Okay. Hello. Uh, Ted, good enough I'm asked with. I see we're running out of time, but uh, sorry. the small towns would have a big problem with this. And the most neglected areas is the small towns because now we don't get response for anything other than anything major from the RCMP. So now this, this program is designed to start to supplement that and I see the rural municipalities are adding police force. Is this an admission that the police, RCMP are no longer capable of doing the complete what they used to do? I wouldn't say so, but that aspect of, of the decision making between the, the province and what the RCMP can do, Bit about, it's a bit outside my, my wheelhouse, as it were. Um.